Over the past couple of years, I've been asking many of you in this fiber arts community about what struggles and challenges you face. We talk about time and the challenge of making time or finding time to make things, but another big resource that is a challenge is how much fiber arts equipment costs. It's true, you can get a pair of $2 knitting needles from the dollar store, or you can get a $40 pair or a $50 pair of knitting needles. They're both gonna do the trick. Right? I have talked before about getting started with weaving for free with nothing but a piece of cardboard. You can make a simple frame loom and you can see if the idea of weaving captures you. But what if you do if it does capture you? Maybe you want to make giant wall hangings or shawls or dish towels. Whatever you want to weave, it's unlikely that you will want to weave that on a cardboard loom for the long haul. So at a certain point in time, you're gonna to want to invest a little bit in the direction of your craft. And so let's talk about that today. Hi there, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Felicia from Sweet Georgia, and we are a hand-dyed yarn company based in Vancouver, Canada. And we also produce an online fiber arts school called the School of Sweet Georgia. Every Friday we come here and we talk about yarn and fiber, and today I wanna to talk about how to buy a weaving loom. I recently went through the process of buying a new loom, and so I wanted to lay out my thought process and considerations with you, and maybe it would help you with your own decision-making process if you're thinking about buying a loom too. So when I began the process of buying a loom, I did research the different loom manufacturers to see what was available. I already have looms from Schacht, Louette, and Ashford, but I also did some research into other loom manufacturers that I wasn't as familiar with, like Lamacra, Harrisville, Leclerc, and AVL. And I wanted to see who makes jack looms, who makes countermarsh looms, who makes counterbalance looms, who's making dobby looms, who makes affordable and accessible looms, what kind of support is available for these looms. My goal is not to find a fancy loom to lust over because I know that loom lust is a real thing, but how do I find the right loom for me and my needs? So as I mentioned last week, we are getting a new studio for Sweet Georgia, and in this new studio will be a separate fiber arts studio where I will be able to set up a new loom for teaching. So my needs might be a little bit different than your needs, but mainly I needed a loom that is a multi-shaft loom so that I can teach different weave structures. I needed it to be a floor loom so that I can be efficient with the production of this cloth so that I can film it and show you. And I also need it to be a relatively affordable loom so that my teaching can be accessible. I wanted to get a loom to teach weaving so that anyone can look at what I make and say, I can do that. I can get that loom and I can do that. The loom that I chose is also a loom that you can frequently find on Craigslist or other marketplaces. So it should be pretty accessible. So I think that the decision-making process for buying a loom is guided by two things. Your desires and your limits. Know yourself and know your limits. It's at its most fundamental, it's really about balancing your wants and your needs. So my advice here is to know yourself first and then know your limit. I think here at the casinos they say, know your limit, play within it. I think that's how they advertise the casinos. <laughs> but whenever people email me to ask me what loom to buy, I find that I always respond um, and I start by asking, well, what do you want to weave? And then the question after that is, how much space do you have and how much do you want to spend? So in January 2006, I began taking weaving classes at Place des Arts in Coquitlam here as a complete and utter beginner. I almost didn't really know what the difference was between warp and weft, but within a few moments of winding a warp, throwing the shuttle, I was hooked. So five months later, I ordered a 44 inch wide eight shaft floor loom from Louette in Holland, and I was going around telling people that I was gonna become a weaver. <laughs> So I absolutely understand that not every person who dips their toe in the waters of weaving is going to jump in with both feet like I did and buy a brand new 45 inch wide multi-shaft floor loom. 
at the time, there were a lot of things in play in my life, including I was celebrating a milestone birthday, which caused me a lot of anxiety, a lot of disruption, and a lot of soul searching. I was also going through sort of like a spiritual awakening, which included, among other things, starting down this path of trying to become a weaver. So I know that my situation might be a little bit unusual and might not be your situation. It's more likely that you're curious about weaving um, and curious about the cloth that can be made on a loom. Maybe you're a knitter. Maybe you have tons of yarn stashed up, like knitting yarn stashed up. Maybe you've heard that weaving can use up yarn stash more quickly than knitting. Um, in any case, you likely want to try weaving and kind of play with the process to judge the results and see if it's something that you would like to pursue. So when I started, I was very lucky to have the opportunity to try a bunch of four shaft table and floor looms, including jack looms and counterbalance looms. I had the opportunity to try these things before I decided to buy my own. So within those five months, I had access to all these things. So I had the opportunity to try and play. So if you don't have the opportunity to borrow equipment or test equipment. The next best thing is that you'll have to buy your own equipment. So let's talk about these two things now. To know yourself and then to know your limit. Even if you haven't done a ton of weaving, there are bound to be fabrics that appeal to you. So, you know, you're going to gravitate to certain kinds of cloth, certain things that you've seen pictures of. So maybe spend some time gathering photos or samples of things that you find yourself enamored with. So maybe you're in love with rep weave placemats, or maybe you love warp faced scarves, or maybe you're intrigued about weaving a weft faced rug. Whatever it is that you find yourself interested interested in, just follow that trail and then ask weavers what kind of equipment they used to get that result. So at that time in 2006, I was inspired by many weavers who were working with fine silk yarns. So it became my goal to create things like handwoven scarves and shawls that had been woven in fine silk yarn that had been dyed using natural dyes. That is what intrigued me in 2006. And so in order to weave those summer winter weave structures and the double weave projects that I had envisioned, I knew that I needed at least an eight shaft loom. And at the time I had also successfully woven a big wide mohair blanket and I loved that process. So I knew that I wanted a wider loom to accommodate wide blankets or shawl warps. So I chose to go with a width that would fit in my house. Your weaving interests and needs might change with time. So after I had babies, I became entranced, like mesmerized with the idea of weaving baby wraps. And so luckily the loom that I had could accommodate those wide warps. Now, we come to current day and my interests have evolved again and I have this very deep curiosity right now about weaving rugs. So following that trail, it's led me to considering counterbalance looms that have a very big, heavy, and solid frame. And so for the new studio, I ordered a 45 inch wide Leclerc Mira counterbalance loom that is going to arrive in a couple of months. So this new loom has only four shafts, so I'm not planning on weaving a lot of complex weave structures on it or anything, but I'm mainly looking for a sturdy and efficient loom for weaving mostly plain weave. I think it's very important to start with understanding your desire. A lot of people who reach out to me will lead with the fact that they live in a small apartment or they don't have money for a multi-shaft loom, but I feel like making choices based on your circumstances will leave you feeling dissatisfied with your results. So if you really, really, really want to weave a wide woolen blanket, but you only have space for a 10 inch wide rigid head of loom, you're always going to feel like you're not equipped to weave what you want, even if that 10 inch rigid head of loom is perfectly awesome. So there's of course a lot of workarounds, like you could weave a bunch of strips and then sew them together to make a wider blanket. But of course, if that weaving doesn't scratch your initial deepest desire, then it will always feel like a stopgap. It'll always feel temporary and a bit like a compromise. So once you know what you want to weave, you'll be able to follow the trail to find the specs for what you need. So I followed the trail of rug weavers to find that rugs need a solid, a very sturdy loom, a loom that can take a hard beating. So like you use the beater and you beat quite hard, sometimes beating multiple times, sometimes using a weighted beater. 
So think a little bit about the kind of fabric that you want to weave. Do you want to make shawls or scarves, dish towels, placemats, curtains, yardage for sewing clothes? Do you want to weave rugs? Do you want to weave blankets? Do you have a particular weave structure that you're interested in, like rep weave or double weave, jacquard? Is the fabric wide? Is it narrow? Like what kinds of yarns do you need to use to make that cloth? Are you using wool, which is very elastic and stretchy? Or is it going to be cotton or linen, which has much less elasticity? Does the cloth need to be beat firmly like rug or a uh, rep weave? Consider even if you want to weave for production, like if you need to weave yards and yards and yards of fabric very efficiently and ergonomically, or if you're just going to be weaving sort of like an occasional scarf in your free time. So ask yourselves those questions to know yourself and know your desire and know what your interest is around weaving. The second thing is to know your limits. What are your constraints? Is it space? Is it cost? Is it time? So let's first talk about space. How much space a particular loom takes up is relative to the size of the room. So a table loom that sits on a dining table that's actually designed for two people is going to be impractical and it's going to feel probably very suffocating. But the same table loom placed in a large living room that's used to hold a grand piano, that table loom is going to feel positively tiny, like it might not even be noticeable. So it's not about the loom or the size of the loom. It's really about how much space you have left after the loom. So you can consider looms that take up less space. Small frame looms, small rigid heddle looms, table looms, even floor looms that fold up take less space. It's all relative. Looms that take up more space are things like the larger rigid heddle looms that are on stands. Like you can get a 26 inch wide, Tab uh, rigid heddle loom, put that on a stand, that takes up quite a bit of space. Table loom on a stand also takes up more space. Floor looms that have fixed frames, uh, so like the mirror loom that I have is a big giant wooden box frame, and very very wide floor looms. All of those looms take up more space. So smaller doesn't mean less capable. We have woven things on small 15 inch wide table looms, but you can get larger ones like 20 inch or 25 inch table looms. You can get table looms that come as four shafts or eight shafts. We've been playing with the Ashford table loom at the studio and it's it's beautiful. Like it comes in 16 inches, 24 inches, 32 inches, and then there's also four shaft, eight shaft, 16 shaft options. So like the possibilities are actually quite endless. So there's no need to get a floor loom if you don't have space for it. Is one of your limits cost? Because again, this is all relative. Generally, smaller, less complex looms will be less expensive. As looms get more features and functions like stands or multiple shafts, sectional beams or computer dobby systems, all of these features will increase the overall cost of the loom. Finer woods or stronger woods might also increase the cost. There are looms that you can get for less than a couple hundred dollars, and then other looms that run tens of thousands of dollars. Like there are plenty of looms that cost more than my first car. But just because it's fancy or expensive doesn't mean that it will be the right loom for you. So you have to remember to go back to your initial thoughts about what you want to weave. So the the new Leclerc mirror loom that I ordered is not an expensive floor loom relative to the other floor looms that are on the market, but it's hopefully exactly what I need for the kind of weaving that I want to do. Now I want to mention one more thing about cost, and that is that gear acquisition and loom lust is a real thing that I try to be very wise about. I try to be a good steward of resources. I try. It's easy to fall into the trap of wanting a new loom or the loom that everyone else is using, but my whole point today is to make sure that you're focused on what you want and what you need. All of the loom and the weaving equipment that I have here has been acquired over a long period of time, like more than a decade of sort of like buying a shuttle here, buying a thing over there, receiving gifts of weaving equipment, and then buying used equipment, buying new equipment. It's all been acquired very, very slowly, bit by bit. So don't look at, you know, what I'm talking about and think that you need all of it right now, right away. So what I did was I made a little PDF that you can download that basically talks about exactly what you need to get started with the weaving. You don't need all the things. You basically need a loom that holds your warp and a shuttle that holds your weft. And of course you need like a few other little accessories and I'll list those, but that's 
basically it. So if you want the download, that's going to be available through the link in the description box below. So that's what I'm going to say about money. So now let's talk about if your limit is time. One of the things that holds people back from trying weaving is hearing stories about how long it takes to warp a loom. And personally, I've come to love every part of the weaving process, except for twisting fringe. I don't like twisting fringe at all. <laughs> So winding a warp, threading heddles, slaying the slots of the reed, every single step, I enjoy every bit of that. But I guess I can understand. It's a little bit like if a knitting pattern asked me to cast on 800 stitches, I would kind of go, uh. and I, I can see how that would be sort of the same as being asked to warp a loom with 800 warp ends. So I guess it would be intimidating either way. In any case, if the thought of the length of time needed to warp the loom is holding you back from weaving, then maybe you will be drawn to the simplicity of warping with a rigid head of loom. So you can get a rigid head of loom and be warped and weaving on it within an hour, as opposed to sometimes it takes weeks for me to get my floor loom warped. But again, I mean, that's just me and my schedule. It might take you a couple hours, might take you a couple days, it takes me sometimes a couple weeks. But if you have plenty of time, maybe warping a loom is not a big deal. You have to also think about how much you need instant gratification and if you might be more project or product driven or more process driven. So I often feel like a rigid head of loom is faster to get going and get started with weaving. Like you zoom through the warping process, but once I'm actually weaving on the rigid head of loom, personally, my movements are slower. So while it takes me longer to warp and set up a floor loom, my weaving movement is faster. So maybe it all kind of evens out in the end. And another thing that I've been thinking about recently is kind of your own body and the sensation of how you interact with the world. I recently started to read more about sensory, sensory processing and make connections about this idea. So like if you've ever noticed uh, that sometimes you crave certain kinds of movements or certain kinds of sensations, like some people really like crunchy things, chewy things as opposed to mushy things. For me, I recently started baking sourdough bread during the pandemic and I remember why I love baking bread. There's this feeling of like kneading and pushing the dough it's a kind of sensation that feels satisfying to me. And I remember the same feeling when I'm drafting fiber for spinning and also for weaving. I love the feeling of moving the beater on the loom and throwing the shuttle back and forth. It feels good to my body. So even though it's still weaving, the action of the rigid head of loom feels different to me. The action of weaving on a frame loom just feels different. It's not bad, it's just different. And I understand that for myself, the sensation that I enjoy the most is this feeling of moving the beater. So other things you might consider include, is your loom new or is it used? If it's used, can you still contact the manufacturer for replacement parts? Can you get support? Is it a loom that requires more than one person for the warping process? Or is it something that you can manage on your own? All of these things to consider. So understanding what you want to weave and what kind of equipment is necessary is the first step. Then figure out what kind of equipment fits within your constraints. So with all these questions and considerations that I've mentioned, I'm trying to help you figure out what you want to weave and then consider the kinds of looms that would help get you there. So as a rough guide, I'll explain what looms I have been using in my past and what they're good for. So at the studio and here in the attic here, we have a number of rigid head of looms from Ashford and from Schacht. We have the Ashford sample it looms and they come in a couple of different widths. And I also have the uh, flip loom from Schacht. That's a much wider rigid head of loom and it folds for storage, for portability, all that kind of stuff. So these rigid head of looms are great for weaving scarves, shawls, uh, kitchen towels, table runners, placemats. The wider ones have been used to make even like double weave blankets on a rigid head of loom. That's possible as well. You guys have also seen that I have a Shacked Baby Wolf 8 shaft floor loom, which is a jack loom. So with a jack loom, if I step on the foot treadles, it activates the shafts and the selected shafts and those warp threads will go up and it leaves all the other warp threads where they were. They just get left behind. So the Baby Wolf has a 26 inch wide weaving width. So it makes it good for 
Some of the same things as the rigid heteloom, but it's also wider for weaving shawls. You can also weave that double weave blanket on a baby wolf. It's just very versatile and it's a beautiful, beautiful loom. It's light enough that I put it on a little rug and I actually slide it around my living room to wherever I need it. So I can, I can weave on this loom when I watch TV and I've seen people put this loom on casters and then they wheel it out to their backyard or their porch in the summertime. It's lovely. It's just, it's very, it's very versatile and flexible. So my other floor loom is not portable. Like I don't move it anywhere. It stays here in the attic forever and ever and ever. It's a 45 inch wide Louette spring eight shaft floor loom. So this loom is a countermarsh loom, which means that every time I push the foot treadle, I activate the shafts and the selected shafts and warp threads will go up, but all of the other shafts and warp threads will go down. And so that makes the shed opening where some of the warp ends go up and some of them go down, it makes a very, very big shed opening. And so it's way bigger than a jack loom. It also applies even tension on both the upper and the lower warp threads. So that can be really helpful to making a smoother, more evenly tensioned cloth. So I find this especially useful when you're working with a yarn that's less elastic. So like cotton and linen and silk. So generally I make my wool projects on the baby wolf and then I reserve things like silk scarves and shawls for the spring loom. So projects that need thinner, finer yarns go on the spring. So the most recent loom that I ordered is this 45 inch wide Leclerc Mira four shaft loom, which is a counterbalance loom. Counterbalance means that a pair of shafts are connected to a pulley. So when one shaft goes up, the other shaft that's connected to it will go down like this, right? They kind of, they balance each other out. <laughs> so again, with this kind of loom, you're getting that big shed. One will go up, one will go down. So getting a big shed with your warp ends, but it also operates with this mechanical advantage of the pulley. So it should theoretically take less effort to treadle. So also theoretically, the benefits would be this big shed, the even tension on the upper and lower warp threads and easier treadling. But the compromise is that it can be more challenging, but not impossible to weave unbalanced weave structures like a one over three twill. I also selected the four shaft option for the mirror loom. So I'm basically limited to weave structures that can be woven on a four shaft loom. Again, more shafts means more complexity for weave structures, but also more cost. So as you can see, asking what loom to buy is kind of like asking how long is a piece of string. It all depends on you and what you want to weave and what it will take to get you there. It's a balance of size, complexity, and cost, and there's lots of other things to consider as well. So I hope that some of these points might help you find your way to the loom that was meant for you. So that's it for today. I would love to hear if you have a weaving loom and what your thought process was like for choosing your loom. And if you have any advice for new weavers about what to buy or what to avoid. <laughs> if you like this episode, please do click the like button. It helps people find our stuff. And if you wanna see more stuff like this, please do subscribe. And we come here every Friday or almost every Friday and we talk about knitting and yarn and color and fiber. And we talk about the fiber arts we would love to talk about that with you. Thanks so much for being here. I will see you in the next one. All right, bye for now.